Chapter 9 Lord Byron John Milton's Paradise Lost, 1674, gives us an important view of Satan as one who chooses evil as his good. Quote, but of this be sure, to do aught good never will be our task, but ever to do ill our sole delight, as being the contrary to his high will, whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labour must be to pervert that end, and of good still to find means of evil. End quote. As against God's providence, which makes all things work together for good to the chosen of God, Romans 8.28, Satan decrees that the enemies of God must seek to create an evil providence, one that perverts God's purposes and makes them evil. As Camus has said, because God chooses good, we must choose evil. Milton Satan stresses that his choice is what God calls evil. He asserts the transvaluation of all values and all morality. Quote, Heal horrors, heal! Infernal world and thy profoundest hell receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free, the Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. End quote. These lines make clear that Milton was an unwitting father of the Romantic movement. The Romantics took their cue from Milton, Satan in their thinking and posturing. They made evil their good, rebellion became a virtue, and the solitude of evil, its separation from God and man, became a mark of virtue and of heroism. The mind became, for Romanticism, poetically and philosophically, as in Descartes, Berkeley, Hume, Kant, Hegel and others, their real world. Theirs was, quote, a mind not to be changed by place or time, end quote, the creative mind of man would make its own world. Certainly this was true of George Gordon Byron, 1788 to 1824. Not only did Byron enjoy evil, he seemed to revel in giving the impression of a defiant contempt for morality and restrictions on his anarchic freedom. Like all the romantics, he had a sharp eye for evil, not to condemn it really, but to call attention to the fact that the leaders of society were evil men. Thus, in the poem, The Devil's Drive, he portrays a devil as leaving the earth in shock because he sees greater evil in Parliament than in hell. Byron is delighted to report on this quote-unquote fact. Since Byron's many sins may have included incest, and he made sure we would think so, his concern with sin was not a moral one. In his poem, To Belshazzar, he condemns that ruler as, quote, unfit to govern, live or die, end quote. Byron wanted, in all things, a heroic confrontation with judgment, a defiance of God and man. Byron cultivated an offensive manner, as in his epitaph, which asked men to urinate on the grave of Robert Stuart, Marquess of Londonderry, Viscount Castlereagh, 1793 to 1821, one of England's more important leaders. Old and mentally disordered, Castlereagh committed suicide. He had been, among other things, Napoleon's nemesis. But what did Byron say in his epitaph? Quote, Posterity will ne'er survey a nobler grave than this. Here lie the bones of Castlereagh. Stop, traveller. Byron took a childish pride in such things. Very early, the Romantic movement manifested a delight in vulgarity and crudity, which in time became pornographic. The Romantics posed as martyrs while reveling, in most cases, in cruel insults and bad conduct. 
they were thin-skinned to criticism and voluble in insults. Byron wrote some poems on Napoleon. He was drawn to losers. The victorious to him, as to Milton, Satan, were the repressive forces of the world. King Saul, Napoleon, Sardanapalus, Manfred, Cain and like persons were at the centre of his poetic vision. To look at the losers of history rather favourably was a form of rebellion against both God and man. Those whom the Bible would see as the enemies of God, the Romantic mind was determined to declare heroic. The Romantic mind loved suffering more than joy, and it regarded the destiny of the sensitive soul to be one of suffering. Byron concluded his poem, quote, Euthanasia, end quote, with these words, quote, Count o'er the joys than ours has seen, count o'er thy days from anguish free, and know whate'er thou hast been, to something better not to be. End quote. With solitude and suffering, the Romantic also indulged in quote, passion, end quote, and Byron rightly described Rousseau as the source of this. Quote, Here, the self torturing sophist, wild Rousseau, the apostle of affliction, he who threw enchantment over passion and from woe wrung overwhelming eloquence, first drew the breath which made him wretched, yet he knew how to make madness beautiful and cast o'er erring deeds and thoughts a heavenly hue of words like sunbeams dazzling as they pass, the eyes which o'er them shed tears feelingly and fast. End quote. The determined melancholy and isolation of the romantic is described repeatedly. Life in, quote, this world of woe, end quote, canto 3, 5, is a grim ordeal for the aristocratic romantic. His only community is with nature. Quote, the desert, forest, cavern, breakers foam were unto him companionship. They speak a mutual language clearer than the tome of his land's tongue, which he would oft forsake, for nature's page is glassed by sunbeams on the lake. End quote. The romantic person was too good for fellowship with men. He communed instead with his god, nature. To be isolated from mankind, Byron saw his nobility. Quote, I live not in myself, but I become portion of that around me and to me. High mountains are a feeling, but the hum of human cities torture. I can see nothing to loathe in nature save to be a link reluctant in a fleshy chain. Classed among creatures when the soul can flee, and with the sky, the peak, the heaving plain, of ocean or the stars mingle and not in vain. End quote. The romantic contempt for humanity meant in the French Revolution a desire to kill many as unwanted. In Max Stirner and Friedrich Nietzsche, it was a contempt for mankind, and Karl Marx saw the future as one that revolutionary leaders would mould together with mankind. In words that echo Macbeth regarding Banquo's issue, Byron Childe Harold says, quote, I have not loved the world, nor the world me, I have not flattered its rank breath, nor bowed to its idolatries a patient knee, nor coined my cheek to smiles, nor cried aloud, its worship of an echo in the crowd. They could not deem me one of such. I stood among them, but not of them, in a shroud of thoughts which were not their thoughts and still could, had I not filed my mind, which thus itself subdued. End quote. For Byron, all humanity has bad breath, but apparently his breath is scented with violets. In Lara, Canto 117 following, we have a vivid portrait of the romantic hero, isolated, hated, enigmatic, filled with, quote, a vital scorn of all, end quote, fiery passion and more. To despise the common herd was a necessary qualification for heroic man. Byron's Manfred, in fact, denies connection with humanity, declaring, quote, Patience and patience, hence that word was made, 
for brutes of burthen, not for birds of prey, preach it to mortals of a dust like thine, I am not of thine order. End quote. When men renounce God and his law, they renounce their humanity. Men who make laws for themselves or for others are they by saying that the determination of ultimacy, of good and evil, law and morality, is theirs to determine. This is another way of affirming their own deity. Later on, Manfred makes an amazing statement given the incipient existentialism of Byron's thinking. The existentialist affirms the sole reality of the moment, but Manfred, in the soliloquy that begins with the words, quote, We are the fools of time and terror, end quote, declares, quote, In life there is no present, end quote. The past and the future are implicitly denied, but why the present? Manfred, more radical than Jean-Paul Sartre, wanted a disengagement from all time. His existential moment is timeless. His answer to his dilemma is to declare himself outside of time and to welcome death. Quote, My nature was averse from life. End quote. Act 3, scene 1. He declares that his own mind makes quote, requital for its good or evil thoughts. End quote, and the mind quote, is immortal. End quote. Therefore, quote, it is not so difficult to die. End quote. The naturally immortal mind is outside the scope of God's law and its time-related judgments. Similarly, in Sardanapalus, that emperor disassociates himself from time and also declares, quote, I feel no penitence. My life is love. End quote. Time is the area of consequence, the arena for the outworkings of law. By renouncing time, Byron was separating the romantic hero from law and history. God moves inexorably in time and history so that judgment becomes inescapable. The romantic representation of history is as tragedy. The revolutionist hopes to overcome and end history in a final world order without change. Byron saw time very often as defeat. Time means ageing, death, law and judgment. Cain, end quote. Cain, a mystery, end quote, says, quote, I have naught to ask, end quote, and also nothing to be thoughtful for. Cain tells Lucifer, quote, I live, but live to die, and living, see no thing, to make death hateful, save an innate clinging, a loathsome and yet all invincible instinct of life which I abhor as I despise myself, yet cannot overcome, and so I live. Would I had never lived. End quote. The war against God becomes, as with the Marquis de Sade, a war against life. God's law is a way of life, Psalm 1, so that to war against God means in practice a war against morality and life. In a study of the American novel, which, while not mentioning Romanticism, is in essence a study of it, Edwin T. Bowden analysed The Dungeon of the Heart, Human Isolation and the American Novel, 1961. The romantic writer, having renounced God, man and life, is imprisoned in his own being. He lives in a world without forgiveness. Instead of community, there is isolation and an anarchic individualism. Isolation is both sought and feared, idealised and yet seen as a tragic destiny. An identification with criminals ensues because the chosen isolation is from God and from the Christian community. The isolation and the solitude are from both God and man, certainly from the family. The family means responsibility. It means that priority does not belong to the individual, but to the key community, and this, to the romantic, is anathema. No romantic ever saw the family as his happy home and setting. In writers like Thomas Wolfe, we see a, quote, continual self-pity, end quote, a mark of the romantic. Together with this self-pity goes alienation and isolation, quote, 
One of the horrors of evil is that it prevents any real communication of man with man, end quote. Its only antidote is escape. The isolated man seeks some kind of substitute for community. Self-pity prevents any resolution of the romantic hero's problem. The escape into the revolutionary community, which Bowden sees as a tentative hope, is no hope at all. There is no escape from the dungeon of the heart, because it is a prison man always carries with him. Mario Pratz, in his study, The Romantic Agony, 1933, called attention to the reversal of the moral order by Shelley in, quote, The Revolt of Islam, end quote. God becomes the evil one who delights in the horror of the fall, quote, Thus, evil triumphed, and the spirit of evil, one power of many shapes which none may know, one shape of many names, the fiend did revel in victory reigning over a world of woe, for the new race of man went to and fro, famished and homeless, loathed and loathing, wild and hating good, for his immortal foe he changed from starry ship, beauteous and mild, to a dire snake with man and beast unreconciled. End quote. For Shelley, quote, the serpent is the symbol of good oppressed by evil. End quote. Byron cultivated the image of the rebel. And who most represents the authority to rebel against than God? As we have seen in Lyra, Byron described the heroic rebel as possessing, quote, a vital scorn for all. End quote. Canto 1, 17. In The Corsair and The Giaor, we see the same characteristic. Instead of morality and a commanding application of it to life, we have scorn and contempt as the marks of greatness. The satanic smile and hints of secret evils now mark the hero. Doom and gloom are for the romantics marks of greatness. They identify the hero who defies God and man. In Myron's Giaor, we see mention of vampires and vampirism become a part of romantic literature. Life is seen as haunted and full of evils. Man's destiny is a fatal one because God is the enemy of, quote, free, end quote, man, meaning lawless man. Byron acted as though knowledge of his incest with Augusta gave him public validation. It was a, quote, secret, end quote, he tried hard not to keep he was determined to give people more than a hint that he was a Sedean man. To be damned was for Byron an aristocratic privilege. For him, the redeemed of God were the dregs of history. Mario Pratt saw Byron and Swinburne as Satanists. Algernon Charles Swinburne, 1837 to 1909, made clear that his primary inspiration came from the Marquis de Sade rather than Lord Byron. Swinburne, a homosexual, hated God and replaced him with man. Quote, Chorus from Atlanta in Clyden, end quote, Swinburne spoke of, quote, the Holy Spirit, end quote, of man. In his, quote, hymn to Proserpine, end quote, Swinburne wrote, quote, Thou hast conquered, O Galilean, the world has grown grey from thy breath. We have drunken of things lathen, and fed on the fullness of death. End quote. For Swinburne, Christianity was the great disaster and evil of history. Quote. Though before thee the throned Cytherian be fallen and hidden her head, yet thy kingdom shall pass, Galilean. Thy dead shall go down to thee, dead. End quote. Swinburne's poetry is like a bowl of sugar as one's dinner. It is self-consciously poetic, and it cloys and disgusts. His anti-Christianity was what Praz called Swinburne's, quote, holy insurrection, the rebellion of man against God, thanks to which man will become God on earth, end quote. Like Sad, Swinburne saw and held that, quote, crime is nature's law, end quote, and God is, quote, a being of supreme wickedness, end quote. 
Romanticism has seen the triumph of the homosexual in literature, music, art and other fields. This is a logical development. St. Paul in Romans 1, 22 and 23 tells us that homosexuality is the ultimate expression of man's revolt against God and the burning out of man. In verse 27, burned is more accurately burned out. That burning out entails a hatred of God and man and a self-willed isolation. Byron addressed a poem, Lines to the Reverend J.T. Becker, of his advising the author to mix more with society, end quote. Byron began his poem thus. Dear Becker, you tell me to mix more with mankind. I cannot deny such a precept is wise, but retirement accords with the tone of my mind. I will not descend to a world I despise, end quote. But Byron was immensely popular with the reading public. He was a very popular figure and highly successful, and he played to his public. His contempt for mankind was a pose. How could he play the part of a lonely romantic hero, misunderstood and abused if he responded to the plaudits of mankind? In fact, he went out of his way to be repulsive to people, to violate rules of manners and decency as well as morals. It was imperative to view people with contempt, this came out in his brief poem, quote, Who killed John Keats? Who killed John Keats? I, says the quarterly, so savage and tartarly, t'was one of my feats. Who shot the arrow? The poet priest Milman, so ready to kill a man, or Southey, or Barrow. End quote. Keats, 1795 to 1821, died of tuberculosis in Italy. The Romantics knew this, but they preferred to believe that it was his critics who killed Keats, and they freely slandered all who to any degree had been critical of Keats. Myron cited three names. The first was Henry Hart Milman, Dean of St Paul's after 1849, a professor of poetry at Oxford earlier, and the author of the excellent History of Latin Christianity, 1854-55. Milman was a scholar of note, the second, Robert Southey, 1774 to 1843, was a poet laureate after 1813. He was a writer for the Quarterly Review. These two men were both detested by Byron, and the death of Keats gave him an opportunity to blacken their names. On top of that, the romantic belief that their solitary souls were victims of the hostile mob was very important to them. The romantics were champions of victimhood, a stance which has now descended to the masses. Homosexuals, lesbians, many blacks, leftists, artists, and many, many others see themselves as victims. The Romantics made of the peoples of the 20th century a world of victims. Not until the evil influence of such thinking is broken will the 21st century see a rebirth of freedom. The champions of victimhood manifest an ability to create conflict and disaster. <laughs>